Good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad to welcome you to our webinar on this day. I recognize some people who were also our, our info day in uh, late uh, January. So I'm glad to see you again. I'm uh, welcoming you on the behalf of the Lieutenant Colonel Brich, uh, who unfortunately is not here currently, but this is not a problem. Uh, we would like to talk to you about uh, Shuttle, which is our project. So, as you know, Shuttle is uh, financed by the H2020 program, where eight institu institutes and forensic lab have teamed up to develop uh, through a PCP a toolkit which will make more objective the microtrace analysis. So, the main partner are the French um, Ministry of Interior from France, the NFM from Netherlands, Kimea from Greece, uh, Eltec from Lithuania, uh, PJs from Portugal, Arctic from France, and uh, MOPS uh, INP from Israel, and also a university uh, from Amsterdam, Netherlands. Um, I will uh, sh just present our concept and uh, our vision of the of the toolkit tool kit that we want. And uh, to do so, I choose to present the concept through a fictional case. So, hello, I'm uh, Sophia Bercani from the IRCGN, which is the forensic lab of the French Gendarmerie. I'm working with the coordinator, Lieutenant Colonel Grégory Briche, who is the coordinator of the Shuttle project. And, uh, I will uh, introduce the vision and the concept of uh, Shuttle right now. Okay, I think you can see my screen. So, to do so, I choose to introduce the, the vision of Shuttle through a fictional case. So, let's consider the following scenario. Uh, jewelry was robbed during the night. A woman witnessed the entire scene and the description given by this witness and the evidence is collected on the crime scene. Uh, led the police uh, to five suspects. The police officer took some clauses of the suspects and gave them to the expert in microtrace analysis to check if there is a link between the suspect and the crime scene. So microtrace is basically what's left or exchanged at the, at the crime scene during physical contact. It's usually caused by, by the uh, perpetually coming into contact and leaving behind object. It helps to make connection between a crime scene suspect or a crime scene or smaller side. The analysis of a pioneer in the forensic science so Lockhart came up with the basic principle of the forensic science stating that every contact leaves traces. So let's go back to our fictional case. It, a jewelry was robbed during the night and the a woman witnessed the entire scene. The description given by the witness and the evidence collected on the crime scene led the police to five suspects. The police officer took some clauses of the suspect and gave them to the expert in uh, microtrace analysis to check if there is a link between the crime scene and the suspect. So, when the expert gets the clauses, he has to collect the microtrace, microtraces by tape lifting then uh, scan the tape and de determine which microtrace are relevant. And if you found something relevant, it has to extract, extract the trace for further analysis. 
as you noticed, every, everything leans on the expert eyes, and there are short, some shortcomings to do that. It's time consuming to scan all of the tapes for the expert. And um, there is a risk to damage the micro trace by extracting them and to miss something due to the damage. So we need to enhance the current methodology. We need more objectivity and a method less hazardous for the micro traces. We need something like shuttle. So how, what is shuttle? Shuttle, it's, uh, it's a short for scientific high throughput unified toolkit for trace analysis by forensic laboratories in Europe. Uh, as I said during the introduction, it's a financed project by the H2020 pro program where eight European forensic laboratories and um, institutes have teamed up to develop a toolkit which will render more objective and scientific the trace analysis. How we would like the toolkits to do that? By combining tools which will help to solve the current difficulties. I We'll briefly describe it because uh, we, you will get further information in the presentation of uh, Mr. Van der Witt. So we would like the tape uh, change to be a tape uh, with a microscopic grade tape to use it directly on the toolkit. The toolkit will consist in an automated microscope which will uh, acquire micro traces ima images and uh, do spectrometric analysis. Then an algorithm will process the images acquired and uh, cl classify the different types of uh, traces present. Every data obtained will be compiled in a database with a search algorithm, which will help to generate, which will which will help to to generate the pattern recognition procedure, allowing the searching for familiar, similar similar samples in the database. So the purpose of making such a toolkit is um, to make a powerful and versatile toolkit which solves the major issues in forensic science and also improves the information exchange and the synergy between the different criminal research laboratories to fight against the international crime. So I thank you for your attention. Here you can see the different partner involved in the shuttle consortium. And I will uh, let, uh, I will leave uh, Mr. Van der Vee for the next presentation speaking. Thank you. So it's my turn now. I'll switch on the, uh, the camera and the, the, the microphone. Um, I've been giving quite a number of presentations up to date, but not yet webinars, so it feels slightly uncommon on this side of the, our virtual room. Uh, hope I'm understandable. Uh, if not, please let me know. I'm having the conversations in my screen now, so if you have any questions, any remarks, um, please let me know. Hard to understand. Sounds very saturated. Your mic is too close. Oh, sorry. Um, not sure what to do here. Sound here seems all right. Yeah. I'll put the sound a bit further on. This is the same as we did in the last week in testing. Yeah, I mean, we should avoid the fabric to touch the mic. The mic should not be too close from your, uh, your clothes, you know? It's just the thing. Not be too close to... Okay. It's okay. It's okay. Fine. Well, I'll, uh, I'll just continue. Please let me know. It's very funny to look at my own face in the screen here. So after a while, when you, I think it's nice for you to, to know who is talking to you. So I'll keep it on for a while and then switch it off. My name is Jan van der Weert. I'm part of the Netherlands Forensic Institute. I'm part of the Shuttle Consortium. And it's an honor for me to introduce you to the, the Shuttle um, basic thoughts, the shuttle philosophy, and some early bits of the specifications that we will set during the tenders. So, what will I talk about today? 
is um, basically a current procedure. What is the current procedures in the laboratories? Um, then I'll talk about some limitations of those those uh, current procedures. I'll go into the shuttle toolkits and I'll have the, the first glance of the shuttle requirements. So what is our current procedure? Well, actually, when we get something in our lab, we get, for example, this 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 uh, vest, uh, a garment. Um, we are thinking on many things. Uh, are the micro traces? That's of course very important. But also, what's the general state? Is it very worn? Is it very old? Is it new? Are there any damages? Is somebody been stabbed, or is there blood on it? Um, whatever what's the known material is it uh, polyester vest is it uh, polyacrylic whatever so there are many many things that we uh, think but all those things all those questions are based on on the garment on the, the the item we get into our lab and this is basically this sounds very logic if, if you would do this like the, if you would get something like this that these are the questions you would be interested in but in fact those questions are quite different from what you see on on the television when you look at um, CSI or one of those television series. What people talk about there is the nice big instruments that the forensic science institutes have. So on the screen here you see all kind of things, the the, the PCR kind of things, the, the the right bottom, the right top, or the the mass spectrometry, or SEM or uh, FDR, all those nice instruments, and. Of course, we have them. We have those in our lab, and uh, other um, forensic labs in the consortium also have these kind of instruments. But they are not the main kind, the main time obligation that we have. They are only part of the job. Um, these are very advanced instruments. Um, but the main main instrument, the most single most important instrument we have in forensic science, is still the old-fashioned microscope. And this is a very good instrument. This is a very powerful instrument. It's a subjective instrument. It requires that somebody is sitting at the microscope. Of course, somebody has to look through the microscope. Um, this is a good instrument. At, as of yet, uh, forensic science cannot do without microscopes. They are very, very important. Um, and this is a, a type of microscope um, within our lab we do a lot of comparisons so we have a sample and another sample and we want to know are these the same so we look through a comparison microscope as you see here actually make consisting of two separate microscope and what you see through the oculus is a combined image of both so there's a kind of gap between what's common practice in um, forensic institutes and on the other side what's what's the, 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 the knowledge, the, the impression that's been displayed through a television series. Um, so going a bit further into the lab, I'll switch off the, my, my camera. I'm, I'm fed up of looking at myself. Look at the screen, you can still see the, the, uh, the, the, the images. So most important thing is still there. Um, but looking at a, uh, a garment, the garment I, I showed you before, um, if you want to look at small traces that may be present on the garment, as Sophia told, that may be present on the garment, that may point towards a suspect of, of the, the, the guy who killed this lady or who assaulted her, whatever, we need to collect those traces, we need to recover them. Within different uh, groups, within different forensic groups, there are different uh, ways to recover traces. So if you're interested in DNA, uh, interested in uh, skin cells, maybe somebody touched this lady, the garment of this lady, and left some of his, his skin cells on, on her garment, you might be, uh, use stops, as you see on the right of the screen here. Uh, those are used, consist of a uh, SEM stop um, with a little uh, double-sided tape on top, and you can use that to collect uh, skin cells. If you're interested in fibers, then you probably use other kinds of tapes. 
we use the nation, other people use the high tech uh, jailer tapes, whatever. There are several kinds of uh, tapes that are being used in different forensic labs. And you just stick them onto the garment and collect traces. And that's not a single trace at the moment. What you see here on the screen is a uh, an example of a tape. And you see there's loads, loads, loads of fibers on that tape. Somebody has to look through the microscope, look at those tapes and find the correct tape, the correct um, uh, traces that are interesting for the case at hand. And that's not, not the only thing, then when somebody found interesting traces, there's next investigation. So we have the tape lift, as it's normally called, the tape lift. Uh, we do a tape scanning to find the traces. But then we want to go to a another microscope, the comparison microscope. So we have to isolate the things because the current tapes are not good enough for high magnification microscopy. We isolate them. And if you want to go further to micro spectrometry, then glass slides are not good enough uh, in the same way. So we again isolate the, uh, the traces, and go to the next technique. So this is very, very com not complicated, very time consuming technique. So this is um, the standard procedure for many labs with regards to fibers. If you want to go to uh, glass, normally you don't. People don't use tapes. They can use tapes, but uh, normally people use a vacuum cleaner or they beat their garments. So take a stick and beat on the garments to to recover the traces. And again, you will not have a single trace you will have a complete mess of traces, con normally con uh, consisting of a lot of sand, a lot of fibers, a lot of dust, a lot of things, and hopefully, if you're looking for glass, a little bit of glass. All these things are very um, subjective. All the microscopy is subjective. Somebody's looking through the microscope, uh, not only subjective, but also time consuming. Um, and there are some implications of their subjectivity. We are very dependent on experts. In forensic science, experts are very, very important. People have to know what they're looking at, have to have all kind of detailed knowledge on, on the, the traces they are investigating. And of course, with all those knowledge, people are quite expensive. And if they have to spend a lot of time on traces because they have so many traces, that makes the process of forensic investigation very expensive. Also, because many of the investigations are uh, subjective, so somebody's looking through the microscope, it's very difficult to make databases because databases, um, yeah, you, you could store um, impressions or you could store um, uh, observations in databases, but they are not as accurate as people see them. So you can uh, store as a color of a trace, blue. But there are several kinds of blue that, that we all call blue, but they are distinctly different. So it's very difficult to make databases based on subjective information. And because we don't have so many databases, or we don't have the right databases, it's very difficult to make numerical evidential value. In evidential value, there's always the question, well, maybe you have a match, maybe the traces you find on a suspect they agree, they are completely the same as in everything, everything compared to the trace use uh, collected from the, 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 um, the victim. So we have a match between the victim and the suspect. But what does it say? If you look through a database with um, items or persons that are not related to the crime, do we find matches there as well? Is it possible that the match we found is based on chance, old fashioned chance? So. That, that's called the evidential value. What's the value of a match? What's the value of a result? Um, I can make a nice comparison here uh, in um, a running game, a running uh, conquest contest. So you see all these people here. They're running at a specific pace. And all questions, of course, which one is the fastest? Well, of course, that's easy to see. The one you see on the left of your screen, this guy is the fastest. That's clear, that's easy, and that's what basically we would see in forensic science through a microscope. But every time we want to replicate this, this measurement, every time we want 
to change something, to look at other runners, to look to repeat it tomorrow. Maybe we want want to to study how people behave in a couple of weeks. We have to collect all the people again. We have to collect all the runners again to be able to find out who is fastest today. We cannot compare if we only look at this something like this. We cannot compare my time today to uh sophia's time which she ran yesterday whatever in order to do that we need two additional things and these are um uh, symbolized here first we need an environment we need a environment that's fixed so we have to make a, a clear appointment on what distance we want to run there's quite a, 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 this, uh, a difference between, well, let's run for 10 kilometers or let's run for 400 meters. Of course, that's a difference. And the other thing is we need to measure. We need a, a stopwatch, a, a time control. If we can um, agree on those, those um, aspects, so the environment and the measurement, then we can set a, um, a standard. And of course, if we have such a standard, we can check which one is fastest, of course. We can just time all the different uh, runners. But we also can check a runner that runs today with the time that was run a year ago. Even the time that was run by a guy who has been dead for years. Am I faster, am I slower? We can compare that as long as we have the environment and we have the measurement. So we would like a bit of those kind of environment and analysis for forensic science. And of course, people are very busy. They're always busy with cases and always busy with reporting and always busy with the microscopes. And luckily, something, something changed. And, uh, the French Minister of Interior took the uh, lead in forming a consortium, the Shuttle Consortium. So they uh, contacted a lot of people, formed the consortium and sent in a the shuttle proposal to the European Union, and it was accepted. So here's the, the grant number, um, if you want to check that. So uh, the shuttle project is a pre-commercial procurement. I will talk about that only a few seconds. I'll leave that more to um, Maria, who will be giving the next talk. So what's the procurement? Um, shuttle is not a in itself a research proposal. We as a consortium do not say give us money and we will investigate things, we will make things, we will hire PhDs, we will hire postdoc students, whatever, and, and make the things. No, it's a procurement. We set the specifications, we say, uh, write down this is what we want, this is what we need in our process, and we bring that to the market as a tender. We ask different commercial parties. Well, can you make this for us? Can you uh, put in the development uh, to give us this, this kind of toolkit, the, the machine, the toolkit, the method? So this is uh, the, the industry where suppliers, where commercial parties are involved. They can be paid to do the development for us. That's as much as I will say about it. Questions on this? Um, please keep it to the next lecture given by Maria. She knows much more about this than I do. So, going into the details on automation. What's the basic of automation? Well, simple. We have a microscope and we like our microscopes. We do everything with the microscope, but the microscope is subjective. So, what if we just um, remove the oculus, so remove the piece you can th look through from the microscope and replace them with a camera. Well, simple, easy. That's the basic uh, thought of automation and effectively the basic thought of the whole shuttle toolkit. But of course, things are not as easy as that. There's a lot of things added. There's many implications need to re um, you need to replace there's some comment from Marine. just for one person who cannot see the slide don't don't worry about it 
All right, I won't worry about it. Sorry, I, I thought you uh, you were talking to me. There are many implications of this nice camera. Thank you, Adam. Uh, there are many implications that derive that are derived from this choice: remove, replace the Oculus by a camera. One is, well, of course you have. If you use camera, you have uh, objective data, but you don't have an objective method because we will have many results. We'll have many images. We don't look through the microscope, but we still have we, we acquire images, and somebody has to sit at a, at, at a screen, at a computer, look through all these images and say, well, here's an interesting trace, there's an interesting trace, this is what I want to consider next. And of course, then you introduce the subjectivity again at the next level. So you don't want that. So we don't only want to automate the image acquisition, we also would like to automate the image processing. So a computer algorithm has to browse through all the images and say, there's something interesting here, in this position, this coordinates, there's something interesting there, I think it's glass, there's something interesting at these coordinates, I think it's a fiber, there's something interesting there, there might be blood, etc. So this is a, a very important complication, we don't only need automated acquisition, also automated um, uh, processing. We did some initial tests for that, it's possible. What we did here, in a prototype, uh, within NFI we built a, a prototype which is far, far, far from production, but um, still uh, gives quite, quite nice images. And what we did, we acquired some images, uh, did some image processing, and asked the computer, well, give me the image, and if you think something is a blood, make it green, if you think, think something is a fiber, make it red. And that's what you see here. So to the left of the screen is the original image. To the right, there's the overlay of the image classification, the, the, the trace classification scheme. Well, not perfect, but it works. It's, it's a first start. So something like this, that's what we need. The next opportunity is the tape. If we go from... Um, um, microscopic slides to complete tape to automation of the, the, the um, observation, we would like high quality observation of large areas. So, as you've seen, uh, as I've told a couple of minutes ago, what we do, we tape an area, and when, once we find something interesting, we extract it from the tape and put it into glass slide for high magnification observation. But of course, this is not good if you want to go to automation, because then you want to look at everything through a high magnification, high magnification, a very good um, image quality. So what we thought we need, we want tapes that are compatible with high uh, quality, high magnification microscopy. So we want a tape that is clear, uh, microscopically clear, and can be adjusted for high, large areas. So that's a, an opportunity. That's something that we don't do now at the moment because we cannot in the lab um, analyze hundreds or thousands, hundreds is possible, but not thousands or ten thousands of traces. That's just not possible. We don't have the time for that. But if there's no, uh, an apparatus that does that, well, we could as well facilitate it and make the, 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 the tape lift system um, so clear uh, that the whole tape can be scanned at high quality microscopy. Um, there's also some um, research in that. I'm afraid I can't show you the difference. What you see here uh, on the left are wool fibers um, from a glass slide. So the glass slide is the basic golden standard. Uh, glass slides give a very, very nice image and is used um, as a default in forensic labs at, at the moment. What you see on the right is a, a clear tape, so a, a tape that was selected by us um, to provide good image quality. And what you see, well, the image is pretty comparable. You see uh, the scales on wool, you see um, a clear outline of the different things, and um, the, the presentation doesn't give you the, the old-fashioned images through tape, I'm sorry for that. But still, um, 
there's a lot of improvements compared to the old. So there's a, a big start as well in that. Here we have a real challenge. Um, as I told you, experts are very important in forensic science. And we should prevent that experts see the shuttle toolkit, the toolkit that's been developed as a competition. You, you take our jobs or you, you do everything that, that, that we used to do and no, we should avoid that competition. There are many machines in forensic science and experts do use machines and with the right attitude, with the right impression, with the right communication, um, there will be, a there will be uh, the possibility that experts see the shuttle toolkit as a support. So we we do not want to enter competition with the experts. It's not that the expert is better or the machine is better. No, that's that's useless. No, we want to support. So the expert doesn't have time, shouldn't have time, shouldn't take time to do a scanning of a square meter of tape. No, he shouldn't. Uh, the, 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 the toolkit should do the large error scanning and find the relevant traces and hand over to the expert what to do next. Um, what is important here is the acquisition versus interpretation. So I told you the things on acquisition, the camera stuff and the interpretation, so the image processing stuff. In an expert, those two systems, so acquisition, seeing and interpretation, understanding, is all combined within the brain and the eyes of the expert. With a, a toolkit, with automation, those two can be separated. And that's very important. Uh, it might be that, that the, the toolkit, the, the, the microscope, the automated microscope, is situated somewhere in a police laboratory, somewhere um, very far away from the expert. Uh, the, the, the toolkit might acquire images, upload them to a central server, uh, do some initial interpretation, and then the expert from a completely different side of the country, or maybe from a completely different country, might go to those data and uh, check the interpretation of the toolkit, or add, or uh, request more stuff, or whatever. So it's a very important part that acquisition and interpretation are separated. Talking about databases, um, of course, if you have a very nice toolkit and it works, and acquisition works, and interpretation works, we have objective data. We are not subjective anymore. Of course, there might be errors, there might be mistakes, etc. But we could validate those and we could store our results in a database. Well, of course, that's um, a very good way to go to the next level to facilitate um, maybe European or national collaboration. Uh, we could help each other, each other within different uh, forensic laboratories and say, uh, well, we have 100 items that are stored in the database, you have 100 items, and there are many labs that store hundreds of items, so in total we have 10,000 of items in our database. Well, that gives a good basis for statistical processing. We might be able to link cases, so if a burglar um, is working in the Netherlands, but also in Germany or, or Belgium, we might be able to link those cases. We might be able to, to have provenance in cases, so we find a trace somewhere here in the Netherlands, and the police asks us, well, what is this? There's a single fiber, there's a single fiber here, and we have no clue what it is. And we look in the, the database, and well, we have one single fiber that's also in the database, and it was... Uh, acquired, the data was acquired in Portugal, but it was from an Adidas or a Puma um, a jacket. Well, we have real information on the provenance, on the origin of, of things. So, loads of opportunities there, but also, also challenges. And, well, uh, you can think of those challenges. Of course, privacy, if you, privacy issues. If you have a single database and we store um, items from the Netherlands, but also from France, and from Israel, from Portugal, from Lithuania. Of course, if you store all the case file numbers and the names of the suspects, the name of the, the, the crime scenes, the name, we have um, terrible privacy issues. We will not be allowed by our 
uh, directors, by our countries, by our uh, prosecutors, to store all those data in a single database. That will not be allowed. So we have to be very careful about the design of a database so that the relevant things are in there, but case-related information is not in the database. It's possible, but we have to be very, very careful from the start. So with all those challenges, with all those opportunities, we designed this, this process, which we called the shuttle process. And these are the different tools. So the orange box is what we call the toolbox, the shuttle toolbox. And within the, that orange toolbox, there are the different tools. And there's a debate if there are four or five tools. Um, that's the way you count it. First tool is the tape lift. What I explained, we need a tape that's clear, that's microscopically clear, so that we can use the tape for uh, recovery of traces, but also for high magnification microscopy. Of course, we need a microscope. We need a microscope that works in an automated fashion. We need, need tools to process the images that are acquired during the microscopy. And we might choose to combine the last two, uh, two items, to combine the last two tools and say, well, we need the database, but not only the database, but also um, queries or ways to look, search through those database to represent the data that's stored in the database in a way that's useful for the uh, forensic laboratories. So these are the, the tools that we store in the, uh, that, that, the, the tools in the shuttle toolkit. Well, and based on uh, this toolkit, on this representation, uh, we made a number of requirements. I'll talk about them in a minute. But before I go into the details, um, and there's a lot of conversations now, no, nothing important. First on the, the, the schedule we made for the uh, requirements, for every requirement, um, we will present specifications. So requirement, as, as we use it in the shuttle consortium, is a description, a very short functional description so it's nothing with very technical implementation yet. No, it's just a requirement. It, it's just a description of things that we need. And the more specific things, the more detailed things are introduced as specifications. So every requirement that we set um, implies the number of specifications that will also be set. And those specifications will make up the requirement. And with every specification, we will also provide a way um, to validate the, uh, and verify the specification. So we will not only tell you, uh, you as the suppliers, uh, this is what we need, this is our requirement, and this is specs, but we will also tell you, uh, once you give us the, the, the solutions, once we give us, you'll give us our toolbox, this is the way that we're going to test it. So that's known information for you, so you can... Um, maybe mimic those tests, do the tests yourself already, so that you can have quite a good idea how your toolkit will behave in our tests later on. And optimally, you can use those tests, those test descriptions, to optimize your system even before we see it. That, that's, of course, our intention with that. For every requirement, we'll also provide you with some background, some more um, wordy, interpretation, what do we need, or what, what do we intend with this requirement, and give you some references. Well, this this work has been done before. You could have a look there to get the state-of-the-art information. So this is the build of, uh, up of the requirements. And there's one other very important issue, and that's um, that requirement and specification cannot tell you the whole truth. They're part of the truth, Technical um, specifications are very important. We set, we tell you, well, we need a system that needs to uh, have this and this and these specifications. And you give us a system that has these specifications, but it might still be that, that, that the, the solution is not right. It, it, um, it, it, it's according to the specification, but it's just not right. It's completely user, un, user unfriendly. Uh, it's completely non-flexible. It, there are so many things that, that could prevent the system from working in a routine environment. So we set a number of those 
um, what we called KPIs. Might be that the, num the name is changed, but we set a number of those um, issues that are the, those aspects uh, that are um, more subjective, very important, but subjective um, ways to evaluate the system. So, in fact, all the technical stuff is seen as one KPI. It's the main KPI, the, the technical excellence. So we set specifications and we require that, this, that the system uh, follows the specification. That's what we call the technical excellence. But other things that are important is robustness. We cannot have a system. We want Shuttle to be a toolkit that, is being, that will be a international forensic standard. That's quite high in aim, but that's what we intend. We want a new international standard for trace investigation. So if, have, if we have a machine that breaks down every minute, needs um, supplier intervention once a week, it will never be a system. So robustness is an issue. Flexible. Um, of course, a system might be tuned for 80% of the cases, but, but, but there are always things that just a little bit different than, than the routine. Can we uh, use the toolkit as well for these systems? It must be user friendly. Uh, there are a number of people that develop the, the toolkit, but of course those will not be the people that use the, the toolkit on a daily basis. So it has to be user friendly or it will not be used, etc. etc. So we set a number of uh, KPIs, uh, things that are important. The technical excellence will evaluate them as objective as possible. Just set specifications. This is the test and you'll fail, you'll pass or you'll get a score. Uh, that's all clear and all objective. The other things will involve, the, 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 the details are not yet sure, but the other things will involve a subjective a verdict by the users. So requirements. Um, these are very much according to the uh, the tools that I said, so there's a requirement for every tool. Um, and there's six requirements. There will, as far as we know now, be six requirements. And the first one is the tape system. We need a tape system that recover traces. Um, what I told you before, the tape system should be um, compatible with high resolution high magnification microscopy we extended that 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 requirement a bit and we said it should be compatible with further analysis because there's of course microscopy but there's also dna analysis we might have elemental analysis by edx or by uh, icpms or we might have uh, fdr and this will not be possible within the shuttle system but we need a tape system that is compatible so might either be within the tape or there might be ways to isolate traces from the tape so that we can subject them to further analysis. So the microscopy is the is part of the second requirement, but this is extended a little bit. The third one is the automated microscope. Um, various illumination modes. We need a image processing system and we describe that quite broadly, so in a way that it converts the acquired images to information. Um, five is the, the, the database thing, so they're combined, uh, the database setup and the data representation, so the extraction, the queries of the database, they are combined in the, the fifth toolkit. In the fifth requirement, it stores and queries data and helps in interpretation. So that's the main thing, of course. The, the queries in the storage should be such that it really helps um, the, the forensic laboratory. And of course, there are always things that uh, cannot be easily put into one of these categories. So we made an extra, the sixth one, the overall shuttle, uh, overall shuttle toolkit requirements um, with some additional things. So these are the main things for the requirements. Um, I forgot one, one slide, Oop, where am I? Uh, there's a big notabene. The specifications are not com completely complete yet. 
We are still working on this finalization. Um, the big lines should be stable. They should be as I present them in a minute, but details might be changed. So the toolkit provides a tape system to recover traces. Well, we think as a consortium, this is quite an easy requirement because many of the current tapes, even if you buy a tape from the normal um, DIY store or from a um, office store, most tapes are suitable to recover traces. So this is not such a very high uh, requirement. But still, it's good to include it, because if people come up with things that do not uh, suffice, then we should have a way to say, well, this is not okay. So it is a requirement, but we don't think it's such a harsh one. Um, many current tapes can recover traces efficiently. And of course, with tapes, it will be important um, that the tapes are flexible, that we can use them to uh, recover trace from many things, so it might be garments, but might also be knives, might be tabletops, might be bus seats, might be things that are a bit uh, have a curved uh, surface. Uh, it needn't be too flimsy because people who work in forensic basically always wear gloves when working with traces, so we should be able to um, recover things while wearing gloves. <laughs> Sorry for that. So this is requirement one. Going to requirement two, we need a tape that allows further analysis of the recover traces. And the main thing there is the conventional microscopy. That's the main, most important, single most important um, item. But also, it would be nice if we could have a Raman system that can analyze traces that are still in the tape or MSP, the microspectrometry, um, measure a, a complete spectrum of a trace that is in the tape. Of course, not every um, analysis is possible while things are still in the tape. Uh, infrared uh, microscopy, I think, will never be possible with an item with a trace that is still in the tape. I might be wrong, but I can't foresee it. So th there's also a need to be able to isolate traces from the tape. That should be easy. Um, we'll test that with FTAR, ISPMS, and DNA, especially blood or hairs, if they're on the tape. Um, and the, the microscope observes blood. We say, well, we know there's blood. It's, of course, a pity if you cannot tell whose blood it is. So there will be um, extra tests to see, well, if there's blood on the tape, can we still do the DNA analysis so that we can identify the person who shedded the blood? The requirement, there's a mistake in the sheet. Um, I didn't remove it, it was there on the last thing. Um, but that, at least that there will be a microscope. We will require uh, a microscope here. And the microscope should have various illumination mode. And those illumination modes have to do, of course, with discrimination. We are always very interested in discriminating different things. So if you have a red fiber and a purple red fiber, we should be able to uh, discriminate those things. We would like the microscope, the, the image processing tools, to be able to recognize those things and to discriminate them. It's here said that the space resolution should be two microns or better. That's a mistake. Uh, there's, sorry for that. The, the number should be the, the pixel size. So the effective pixel size should be two micrometers or better. And it might be that a little bit bigger is three or four might be allowed as well. This is basically the traces that we look at are normally eight microns, 10 microns, 20 microns. That's, that's about the edge. Um, so we would like to have for every trace a number of uh, pixels. So we should be in the order of two microns, pixel size. So not as it said here, spatial resolution, but pixel size, effective pixel size. Uh, the illumination modes, well, the transmission is the standard nowadays. 
reflection would be very useful for a number of samples, for example, paints. Paints, they scatter a lot, so to effectively observe paints, you might need reflectance. Fluorescence is used a lot in, um, in forensic science as well. Polarization is a difficult one um, because of the orientation um, that cannot be changed in, in tapes. Um, we think it is possible to make the polarization microscopy uh, orientation independent. Polarization would really help in identifying materials. So sand and glass have different polarization. Um, otherwise, the particles, the microtraces consisting of sand and glass might be quite similar. Um, different kind of uh, fibers might be discriminated using polarization. Different kind of crystals, different kind of drugs might be discriminated using polarization. So we will require uh, a polarization facility there. And we would really like some spectrometric imaging so that the the, the color description is very accurately. The exact, the specific um, spectral resolution is not yet decided upon, estimated to be about 5 to 10 nanometers. That will be the, the, the resolution. What am I? Requirement 4. The toolkit will require, we will convert acquired images to information. We will require there to be a, um, a solution that consists of two um, two parts. And one is the GUI, the graphical user interface, and one is the actual algorithm which contains the typo here, sorry for that. Um, this was specifically made because the, the advances, the current state of the art in image processing is so speedy at the moment. What's new today is all tomorrow and it's ancient in a week. So we would really hate if we have a shuttle toolkit, we work on it for four years, so you work on it for four years, and in five years it's completely um, overtaken by new technology. So what we would really like is a, a well-working graphical user interface. So open images, browse through images, uh, maybe save images if, 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 allow, if, if, if needed. Um, store things in a database, open whatever, a graphical user interface, and then we say, well, this is the image and our set of images, and we um, put it towards an algorithm that's a separate kind of part of the, 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 the solution. And that algorithm makes the identification, uh, classification of the different traces and gives it back, gives back the classification of the different traces to the graphical user interface. And we require that the algorithm can be um, swapped. So we we'll require that, that suppliers provide an algorithm, but also that there are descriptions. If I want to make an additional um, algorithm, that should be feasible. So there should be a basic algorithm that the suppliers supply, discriminating glass, discriminating sand, discriminating blood, fibers, whatever, or whatever things they um, deem relevant there, but it might be very well possible that if my lab is very specialized in, in animal hairs, that I design another uh, algorithm that uh, can discriminate cats and dogs and, and guinea pigs, all those kind of different animals. So there will be a need for other algorithms and maybe in artificial intelligence there will be new solutions there. So all kind of possibilities and we thought the best way to approach those would be a separation between graphical user interface and an algorithm that's built into the system as a plugin so that different plugins can be developed later. Uh, we also require that we specify uh, that different traces can be discriminated and visualized. So we want to have our image that, that was acquired by the microscope with an overlay of, well, where did the system find glass? So that we can go back to the, to the tapes and say, well, this is the position, these are the coordinates where you can expect the glass. So the output can be visual, also as a, a table, is of course the, the basis. And something that we expect is, well, we have trace, we number the traces, trace one, two, three. 
there might be coordinates, might be single coordinate, but also a list of coordinates if traces are a bit bigger than a number of pixels. Uh, there will be the properties. We analyze the, the coordinate, the, the trace. What are the properties? What's the transmission uh, spectrum? What's the reflection image? What's the polarization information? And we go to the algorithm, come back and say, this trace is classified as blood. Number one is classified as blood. Number two is classified as a fiber. There's also the number three is here unknown. That's the very important bit that will be specified. Um, traces that are unknown, if, if the, um, the classifier says, well, I have no clue what this is, it should tell us that it has no clue what it is. Of course, the computer always has a best, best opportunity, but if um, it's below a certain threshold, it should tell us, well, I have no clue. Look at it in personally. Um, database, the toolkit stores and creates data that helps in implementation. There will be two bits again, the database structure itself. Within the consortium, there's already quite a bit of, of research into databases. And we'll provide the, the current uh, status of, of our research that you can help. You're not obliged to use that, but you're welcome to, to build on the, the fundament that's already there. We will require that the data that's acquired with the microscope can be linked to the data that's acquired by different um, uh, systems. So it's no use to make a database that's only suitable for shuttle data. We will require that also microscopy, uh, MSP, things can be included there. Um, we will set specifications on the size. Of course, there's no use in having a database that's full when three data sets are measured. That's no use. So we set specifications on the size. Uh, we'll set specifications on exchange collaborations. We will uh, specify that it can be installed in different computers. So it's, there's not a single uh, installation to which we all should have access. We hope that will be the case in a couple of years. But for now, that's not possible. We will not get the, the, the technical specification, the technical opportunities to all access the same database. Forensic labs normally have a quite a strict computer system and it will not be possible to just access everything and upload your data to uh, a central server somewhere in Europe. So we we'll require local installations, but also um, the possibility to exchange. So we have a, a set of data in one database can be extracted and put it into another database. Then we specify a number of representations, we call the representations, um, and that's called a number of extractions, queries. How can we uh, visualize our data? So there's one, one tape uh, visualized in the bottom, and I should be able to ask the, the, the database, well, give me this tape, an image of this tape, and um, notify us, uh, set in this tape, um, marks on all places where you find glass. So, um, in this case, you put red circles. So there are five pieces of glass in this tape, or at least the shuttle toolkit identifies five pieces of glass in this in this tape. Uh, requirement six. So that's the overall kind of things that do not really fit into a single a requirement that we talked about before. Um, there will be a number of things there, and the most important there is the quality assurance traceability. And that's directly to do with the relation to the expert. So, um, most forensic labs are on a quality system, ISO 1725 or something like that. Most of them have experienced experts. And, well, both should trust so the, 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 the system. Um, if we want to use the system in an accredited lab, it should be validated. If the experts trust the machine, he should be able to check every step it makes. So that's why we call traceability. And basically it means that if I get an, an, an extract from the, the, the database, something like this, the, the computer tells me where all the glass is, if I get an extract like this, I should be able to go back to, um, to 
image processing procedures and ask the computer, well, which algorithm did you use to classify these traces? I should be able to go back to the images, show me an image of the of this specific trace. I should be able to go back to the original tapes and say, well, this is the coordinate I found. I should be able to check and uh, maybe isolate this piece of glass. So that's what we call the traceability. We should be able to check every step of the process. Well, the other bit is a very difficult one, modularity and integration, because those are um, completely opposite things. The modularity, well, we have five tools in our toolkit, um, and we discuss these separately. And it would be nice if they could be used separately. So if we have a tape and we have a case in which the microscope cannot be used, it would still be useful to use the tapes. If you have a, a user interface for a, um, an algorithm, it should be very nice if you could also upload images that have been acquired with another microscope. If you have a database, it should be very nice if you could also store data that have been acquired with another system. So uh, it should be so nice if you could use every tool um, as a module and also uh, make it interact with other things that happen in the forensic lab. But also, of course, people have to use the, the shuttle toolkit and they want to experience a, a unity. They want an integrated system. So there's a balance there. Um, of course, this is, has to do with user friendliness. Um, people that work day in, day out with, the, with a system like this, um, they should be trained well, of course, but still they expect that things work well, that things work integrated, that things work smoothly together. This, I think this will be very difficult to, to optimize this, but it will be um, the specifications that set certain limits on modularity, there will be specification that set um, uh, limits on the integration. There will be um, requirements on the size of tapes. We expect that the uh, most limiting thing will there be the microscope, but we didn't include it in the, um, the specification of the microscope because there are other things. It might be that the microscope we finally obtain is very fast, but that the image processing is, is very slow. So it, you can um, analyze a tape in one hour, but the image processing takes three days. And of course, that is, then the system as a whole is slow as well. So that's why we put it on an overall requirement. Um, both the size of the tapes, uh, the size and, and the speed. Um, I mix up two things, but those, those are valid for both the size and the tapes of the size and the speed of the system. So size of tapes, we will specify um, preferably up to A4. So that's about 20 by 30 centimeters. If that's really not possible, we might do with A5 as well. That will probably mean um, that tapes are cut and we'll have to analyze both of the uh, things. But optimally, A4 size would really be um, uh, helpful. And the speed? Uh, we uh, consider the, the specification quite harsh, so we do not expect a system that finishes the tape within 10 minutes. That's just not possible. On the other hand, it will not be useful if we have to wait for one week for a single tape. So we'll probably spec we'll specify something in the order of a, f a couple of hours. So if you go to the A4 size tape, to specify that a number of tapes can be done overnight and a number of extra tapes can be done in 24 hours. So that, that leaves a number of hours per tape. So this, this will still be very fast. We're really a state-of-the-art solution for that. Um, hopefully it will be possible. That brings me to the end of my presentation. I'll switch on the Camera again. Um, I'm not sure if you are allowed to talk to me.
No, I mean, uh, maybe if you want to ask some questions, uh, you can, uh, I'm talking about the audience, maybe please um, ask your questions. We will, um, we can have some time to deal with them from uh, Jack's presentation. And then we will move to uh, the next presentation by Maria about the tendering process. So um, please, uh, the if you want to ask any question to Jap, and if not, uh, Maria will uh, will jump on the, the screen. Okay, so I have we have a question. Stemmer is a component. Yeah, I'm looking at the conversation as one one uh, one one ask a question from Harm Hanekamp, and he says Stemmer is a component supply. What do you expect from us? Mm -hmm. uh, there will be more on that by Maria in a minute. Uh, in short, um, I try not to spoil Maria's presentation, but in short, I can maybe say a few words on that. Um, we, as a consortium, have chosen the lazy way. Um, we could, of course, um, ask for modules, ask for components, integrate them ourselves. But we said, no, if we do that, we will be responsible ourselves for the integration. We will try to outsource that bit as well. So, um, Stemmer is a component supplier, says in the question. Um, if Stemmer wants to be involved in the shot process, um, they say, well, we don't do tapes. I know Stemmer a little bit. They do optical stuff. Uh, we don't do tapes, so we don't do image processing. Then they can't supply all of the, the whole toolkit. So they need to um, join up with other suppliers that can supply the other bits that Stemmer cannot do. Uh, might be in two ways. They might form a consortium and say, well, we um, try to find a contract as a consortium. Or it might be that Stemmer says, um, well, I take the opportunity. I'll just go into the contract myself. And if I cannot make something, I'll buy it. I'll get it from other sources. So a single component uh, supplier basically cannot be involved here. In itself, it should join a consortium. It should join um, um, other companies to, to provide basically the full toolkit. Patrick Vito asked, do you have already contacts with potential suppliers? Um, yes, we do. Uh, that's part of our project is the open market consultation. As we sit here and as we've been in, um, in France last month or two months ago, Yes, the, those are our contacts with suppliers. There's also the RFI, request for information on our website. Those are the contacts. We do not have um, any obligations yet. We do not say to manufacturers or to suppliers, well, you have a, there's a very good chance that you will be involved. Now, there will be public tenders. Maria will talk on that better. There will be tenders. There will be open procedures. Um, we do not have yet potential suppliers, there are of course potential suppliers, we do not have preferred suppliers yet, we do not have any appointments yet with, um, um, how to call that, we do not have any uh, contracts yet, we do not have any, have any uh, preference yet. Not, so there are potential suppliers, but there's nothing fixed yet. The, for this kind of PCP procedures, the European Union request a completely open procedure, and that's what we stick to. That's what we intend to do. Okay, so good evening to everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Campa Maria, and uh, me and Mrs. Eleni Lanou, on behalf of the contracting authority, we will present you the tendering process. Um, Let's start with the presentation topics. Uh, first of all, we will talk about the theoretical background of uh, the innovation procurement. Uh, the second topic uh, will, be co will cover the procurement strategy that will be followed under the shuttle project. Uh, moving on, we have the tender process and the evaluation process, uh, the eligibility, um, and uh, we conclude our presentation with the legal uh, fair framework for the whole uh, procedure. Sorry. Uh, so let's start uh, with the theoretical background of uh, innovation procurement. Uh, first of all, uh, we have uh, two types of innovation procurement. Uh, the first one is the pre-commercial procurement, uh, like a subtle project, 
uh, pre-commercial procurement uh, is about purchase of uh, research and development services by the public sector. Uh, it is not concerned with uh, the procurement of products or services that uh, already exist in the market, but uh, uh, it focuses on the R&D phase, uh, which uh, involves solutions, exploration and design, and prototyping up to the original development of a limited volume of uh, the first product or services. Uh, the second type is the public procurement of innovative solutions. Uh, it is the integration of uh, innovative uh, solutions, uh, um, innovative solutions uh, available in the market into operational deployment. Uh, it does not concern procurement of R&D services uh, like PCP. It can be used following a PCP or directly. Uh, and uh, public procurer, procurers act as uh, the first uh, buyers of the innovative commercial uh, and solution uh, or goods close to the market uh, innovative goods. So, um, in uh, the, the key requirement uh, for uh, progressing into a PCP is that uh, no uh, solution already exists in the market to meet the procurer needs. Uh, there is an identified procure, uh, public need and uh, a challenge is set to the market. Uh, the main features uh, of the pre-commercial procurement, uh, the first one is uh, that it, is, uh, it concerns a radical innovation. Uh, there is no available solution, uh, meaning that there is not available solution in or close to the market. Uh, different competing potential solutions uh, exist, but uh, still uh, there is a need for R&D to do risk and compare technological alternative or approaches. Uh, no possibility to there is no possibility to fix the solution requirements. Uh, there is uh, R&D is needed, uh, or to proceed uh, to large scale deployment. Uh, procurer wants to induce step uh, change in market, and uh, the. PCP uh, procurement is accept accepted from uh, public EU uh, uh, public procurement uh, directives, WTO procurement agreement, and uh, the funding rate uh, is usually 90%. Um, for the main features now from the public procurement of innovative solutions uh, is that uh, mature technical solutions are close to the market. Uh, incremental innovation uh, is needed or non R and D innovation. Uh, there is no R, uh, there is no need for R and D procurement. Uh, suppliers could provide solutions if the market would express clear requirements and sufficient demand to purchase. The public sector act, acts as uh, the first buyer and provides a seal of approval for the innovative solution. And finally, it is not accepted from uh, EU procurement directives, uh, EU remedies directives are also applicable here, WTO, GPA and funding rate is uh, 35%. So uh, the process outline in the procurement strategy, um, okay, uh, we have uh, phase zero, which is the curiosity-driven research. Uh, in uh, the PCP projects, uh, we have three phases. The first phase is the solution design. Uh, the second phase concerns the prototype development, uh, while the third phase is uh, the original development and testing, or testing of limited uh, volume of uh, first products. Uh, and uh, in the PPI uh, procurement, uh, we have, uh, let's say, the fourth phase, which, is, which concerns the deployment of uh, commercial volumes uh, of end products. Um, to be more specific about the process outline, uh, first of all, we have the needs identifications, uh, identification and assessment. Uh, the steps here are the fact uh, are the first one that we can we identify the unmet need uh, or the set of needs. Uh, the consortium conduct a prior art analysis. Uh, there is an investigation regarding the IPRs, the regulation, the standard standardization and certification. Uh, and finally, uh, the consortium validates the identified needs and builds a business case. 
uh, the consortium, uh, Saddle Consortium now uh, is in the open market consultation period. Uh, we, where uh, the steps are the notification of an, the open market consultation via the publication of a PIN. Uh, in this step also uh, there's consulting with other public authorities, uh, the prior definition of requirements and procurement outline and uh, an open market consultation workshop uh, which helps the consortium to finalize uh, the tender documentation. Uh, the next step is the publication of the contact notice. Um, uh, this uh, marks the start of the tendering process. Uh, it raises awareness towards the PCP. Uh, it will allow enough time uh, prior to the tendering process and um, the use of standard template provided by, uh, by the European Commission uh, will be used. Uh, the fourth step is the request for tenders. Uh, and it will include the project description, a project plan, methodology, and team from the contractors, a commercialization plan, and, uh, and the price incorporating the IPR dimension. And the final step uh, is the selection of the R&D providers and awarding of the framework agreement. Uh, open bids will be received within the deadline. Uh, the evaluation of the, tinder, uh, the, the bidders uh, will be against exclusion and selection criteria. Uh, and also against award criteria. And the final step uh, here is the awarding of the framework agreement and the phase contract uh, to the selected contractors. So to move on uh, to more detail uh, in the phases uh, of uh, a pre-commercial procurement, first one, uh, as, uh, uh, as we said before, is phase one which, is the, which concerns the solution design. The key actions are um, R&D providers uh, will be engaged uh, in the design of the potential solutions and verify the technical, uh, economic and organizational feasibility of the proposals in order to address the PCP challenge defined in the pretendering phase. Uh, each of these R&D providers will be requested to deliver the outputs of their work uh, with uh, an end of phase report one. Uh, incorporating all activities uh, of the phase as well as a presentation of the relative results. Uh, also, uh, in phase one, a business commercialization plan uh, will also be requested. Uh, the contracting authority will assess uh, the results that uh, were mentioned before and uh, upon uh, indication of a, a satisfactory completion, it will provide a recommendation regarding uh, their adequacy uh, for payment purposes. Also, the contracting board uh, will assess which R&D providers have successfully completed the current phase and those they are eligible to, for bidding towards uh, the, next, the next phase, phase two. And upon successful completion of the evaluation process, the board will uh, proceed to the awarding of phase two contracts. In uh, phase two, uh, which uh, concerns the prototype development, the key actions are uh, that uh, the R&D providers will be against, engaged in the development of a prototype and will subsequently test the said prototype in lab conditions. Uh, the testing process will take place in either the provider or the procurer's lab uh, as uh, selected by the procurer. Each of the participating R&D providers will be requested by the hosting procurers to deliver the outputs of their work uh, along with an end of phase two report incorporating all the activities um, in, uh, in this specific phase and in this along with a presentation of the relative uh, results. As, uh, uh, as uh, similarly with phase one, the contracting board will assess the results and upon indication of satisfactory completion will provide recommendation regarding uh, their adequacy for payment purposes. Uh, also, the contracting board uh, will assess which R&D providers have uh, successfully completed the phase two and, can, and are eligible to bid uh, towards phase three. And finally, upon successful completion uh, of the evaluation, the contracting board will proceed with the awarding of phase three contracts. So, in the last uh, phase three, uh, which uh, uh, concerns the development and testing of a limited set of products, 
uh, the key actions are, uh, first of all, the successful phase two uh, R&D providers will produce an initial limited set of product uh, services and uh, after testing by the procurer in uh, relevant operational conditions, let's say, um, will uh, field testing results uh, will be incorporated in the updating of the product, uh, producing a final limited set suitable for large-scale production following the PCP. Uh, um, it is not in the scope of the PCP to uh, produce, uh, let's say, uh, lar uh, to have a large-scale production. Uh, each of the participating R&D providers will uh, be requested by the hosting procurers to deliver the outputs of their work uh, along with uh, an end of phase three report uh, that will, uh, sum uh, will summarize all the activities uh, of the phase uh, in, uh, as, as well as the, a presentation of the relative results. The pro-contracting board will uh, also assess the results of phase three and provide recommendation regarding the adequacy for payment purposes. And uh, finally, uh, the same board will also assess which R&D providers has successfully completed the current phase. Moving on to the second uh, topic uh, of uh, the presentation uh, regarding the procurement strategy of SATL project. Uh, let's start uh, with uh, indicative uh, timeline uh, for uh, uh, for the tendering process. Uh, first of all, the project uh, started in May 2018. Uh, the publication of uh, the prior information notice uh, was in November 2018. Uh, we had an open market consultation event in January uh, 2019 in Paris. Uh, and uh, it is expected to have a contract notice uh, in uh, two months, um, in May 2018. Uh, the tendering process uh, will um, continue until, until October uh, 2021, uh, where uh, at uh, the end of the tendering process we will have two, two toolkits validated and tested. So, uh, for the procurement methodology, uh, Subtle project confirms that uh, the procurement methodology will be implemented in compliance with the specific requirements for the implementation of uh, Horizon 2020 co-founded PCP, PCPs and uh, with a model of uh, grant agreement for PCP actions following uh, the below steps. The first step, uh, prepare uh, the common uh, tender specification based on a hybrid model, uh, which will take in co into consideration the findings of the open market consultation and the buyer group uh, and the buyer's group set of uh, common tender specification and conditions of participation to the procurement. The formulation of the tender uh, ensures that all the solutions discussed will be covered in the final specifications. Uh, the second step, um, a, a contract notice uh, will be published by the contracting authority in the official journal of the European Union. Uh, the aforementioned document will be in English specifying that the procurement concerns a pre-commercial pre procurement that it is accept, expect, exempted from uh, Directive 24 of 2014 and uh, 81 of 2009 and indicating the, the way that potential tenders can take part in the request for tenders. Uh, this contract notice will be promoted and advertised widely using uh, Horizon 2020 Innovation Procurement Newsletter, uh, Horizon 2020 Internet Site, National Contact, contact Points, and uh, of course, uh, Subtle Website. According to the tender rules and procedures, in case of an open uh, public procurement procedure, the minimum time limit uh, for submission of tenders is 35, 35 days from the publication date of the contract notice. Um, the selected approach for ensuring effective uh, timely evaluation of proposal in contracting uh, will be stated in the project uh, in the project term of reference. The third step uh, includes that all the necessary tendering documentation will be made public according to the plan and the procedures defined. A request for tenders will be published, inviting all industrial economic operators to participate in the tendering process. 
Uh, this request for tenders uh, takes into consideration the finding of the open market consultation and describes, describes the common challenge using functional and performance-based specifications and being in line with the requirements defined uh, in phase zero of the project. The request for tenders describes also uh, the process for the evaluation and selection of the tenders for the first PCP phase. Uh, it also includes the intermediate evaluation for its uh, following PCP phase, the minimum requirements uh, that subcontractor must comply uh, with uh, during the PCP, and the arrangements for the IPRs, confidentiality, publicity, uh, the rules on applicable law and dispute set settlement. Before the deadline to deliver the proposal, the consortium will be engaged in order to support all the potential contractors uh, by answering questions related to the call for tender. Uh, for this reason, uh, in um, the subtle website, uh, there is a QA form that it is available, but that it is already available. Uh, the fourth step is the evaluation and ranking of uh, the tenders according to the best value for money criteria and uh, ensuring that the price corresponds to market conditions. Uh, the fifth step is the subcontracting uh, awards uh, to a minimum of four tenders that uh, will be sufficiently evaluated from the technical and financial perspective in uh, the previous step. Uh, after that, the framework uh, agreements, uh, each selected tender will uh, sign one agreement. Uh, so uh, the framework agreements will be signed between the contracting authority and the selected tender, setting the terms and the conditions. And uh, the final step uh, is um, that the contract award notice uh, will be published within uh, 48 days after the conclusion of the framework ag agreement by the contracting authority in the official journal of the European uh, Union. Uh, moving on to the tender process and uh, the evaluation. So, uh, the common evaluation criteria methodology that will be used has uh, the following steps. Uh, first of all, is the definition of the exclusion criteria based on the provisions uh, in the EU procurement directives. Uh, the second step is the definition of the selection criteria in compliance with the treaty principles, which are primarily related to uh, the suitability of the uh, bidders to perform the professional activity, the economic and financial studying of the bidder, and the technical and professional ability. Uh, in the third step, in addition to the price, the definition of the award criteria uh, will take place in this step in compliance with the treaty principles of equal treatment and transparency. Uh, this includes, for example, criteria based on the quality, impact and implementation of the submitted proposals. The quality part could refer to the ability to address the challenge, uh, the novelty of, um, of the proposed solution approach and the technological soundness of the solution concept. Uh, regarding the impact part, it could refer to the added value to the society or economy um, or the soundness of the commercialization plan, uh, while the implementation part, uh, it could refer to the quality or effectiveness of the proposed R&D work plan and resource allocation. Uh, in the tendering bo bodies that exist in the subtle pod project, uh, first of all, is the contracting authority, which is the Center for Security Studies, CHEMEA. Uh, the second one is the contracting board, uh, which consists of uh, the subtle forensic laboratories uh, with the contracting authority. Uh, the same uh, is for the technical board. And finally, there is the Kemea subtle procurement board. So, uh, the tender procedure and evaluation, uh, the, in the subtle project, the open procedure has been adopted. The tendering process will be conducted in one stage that uh, will include uh, the tender solvency and uh, the financial and technical evaluation, uh, along with the award of the contracts. The term of reference document will be published with all the necessary information in order for the industry to understand the scope of uh, the tender. Uh, also, the same document will define in detail the operational validation process, uh, the requirements, the specifications, uh, the technical and common economic criteria that will be used in order to evaluate the, the tenders, uh, in order to extract the most economically advantageous ones on the best price quality ratio. Uh, the term of reference uh, is assumed as the principal document during the tender, 
and uh, all its provisions shall remain fully valid and applicable during the whole tender process, uh, unless it is uh, otherwise stated. The economic operators will submit a request to participate containing all the information requested in the tender document. Uh, the exclusion grounds uh, will allow the consortium to exclude candidates from participation uh, in case that the economic operator have been sub subject of a conviction, uh, conviction by final judgment uh, for the reasons referred to the selection criteria. And the Kemea Saddle Procurement Board will evaluate the solvency documents of the participants and uh, then it will submit its opinion to the contracting board uh, for the final decision. So, uh, the technical evaluation process of the tenders will be carried out by the relevant committees and uh, will result in a unique and joint evaluation report based on consensus. Uh, those tenders will exceed the ma uh, that uh, exceed the maximum amount allowed for the financial tender uh, shall not be taken into consideration. Uh, the contracting authority may request justification by those tenders uh, that offer an extremely low financial tender. Uh, the contracts will be awarded to the tenders showing the best uh, value for money, that is to say, uh, to the tender offering the best price quality ratio using scoring model, which includes evaluation criteria with automatic evaluation and evaluation criteria based on the value judgment. Uh, financial evaluation will be done using criteria which uh, are automatically evaluab evaluable, and technical evaluation will be done following criteria based on value judgment. Um, if uh, the tenders fail to provide the documentation needed uh, on any of uh, these award criteria or do not fulfill all the requirements, their proposal will not be assessed with, with respect to the criteria in question. Uh, the maximum scoring obtained after the proposal evaluation will be 100 points, where the 20% 20, uh, 20 points uh, correspond to the financial proposal and the 80% points correspond to the technical proposal. And uh, below you can see the scoring model that uh, will be used. So uh, now I may pass the floor to Mrs. Lanou uh, to continue with uh, the last two presentation topics. Uh, of course, we would like to highlight that the procedure is open and the treaties of uh, equal uh, treatment, the, the, the principle of equal treatment is, uh, of course, uh, applied. So, tenders may, uh, may submit an offer as a single entity or in collaboration with others as uh, joint tenders or uh, in terms of uh, subcontracting. Sub uh, or, of course, uh, any potential bidder could, uh, could uh, combine the two approaches. So, more incomplete, uh, every natural person residing in one of the following countries, uh, uh, countries of the European Union, of the uh, European Economic Area Member States, uh, Horizon 2020 Associated Countries, uh, having signed a bilateral agreement with uh, the European Union, uh, specifically on, se on security procedures for exchanging and uh, protecting classified information. And of course, legal entities established uh, under the law of the, of the same uh, countries as we uh, mentioned uh, above. Uh, that is to say, the European Union and the economic, uh, European Economic Area Member States and the Horizon 2020 Associated Countries. Uh, and of course, uh, also entitled to participate uh, are uh, groups of uh, economic operators of, uh, of the above natural person or persons or uh, legal entities submitting, as we said, a joint uh, tender. Uh, tenders, uh, on the other hand, will be excluded if they fall within one of the following categories, uh, categories that are related to the structure of groups of operators where, for example, a single economic operator or affiliated entity is participating within uh, more than one group of operators or both a single tenderer and a member of, uh, of a group of operators, or where a single economic operator or affiliated entity has already participated as, for example, as contract, a subcontractor or partner in, uh, in subtle project. 
uh, when we mention affiliate identity, it means an illegal entity directly or indirectly controlling, controlled by or under common control with that economic operator, or of course it's a subsidiary, for so long as uh, this control uh, lasts. Uh, tenderers will also be excluded uh, 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 when we as contracting authority have, uh, have we have sufficiently indications that uh, the economic operator has entered into agreements with other economic operators aiming, aiming at uh, distorting uh, the competition where a conflict of interest that we said above uh, <clears throat> cannot be effectively uh, uh, remediated or by other less, uh, less intrusive uh, measures, where a distortion of competition from the prior, prior involvement of uh, economic operators in the preparation of the procurement procedure cannot be also uh, remediated uh, by other less instructive measures. And of course, when uh, where the economic operator has shown significant or persistent deficiencies in the performance of uh, a substantive uh, requirement under, uh, not of course this uh, this uh, contract, but under a prior uh, public contract. <coughs> Other exclusion grounds, and all these grounds are of course indicative. indicative uh, we may add more, but uh, everything is depending on how we will uh, uh, deal with the exclusion grounds uh, as set by the uh, procurement directives. Uh, where the economic operator has been guilty of serious means uh, representation in supplying the information required for the verification of the absence of grounds for exclusion or the fulfillment of the selection criteria. Uh, of also, where the economic operator has undertaken to unduly influence uh, the decision-making process of the contracting authority to obtain confidential information that may confer upon it undue advantages in the procurement procedure, or to uh, provide misleading information that may have a material influence on decisions concerning exclusion, selection, or uh, award. Failure to obtain and maintain relevant licensing or membership of an appropriated trading or professional organization where required by law is also a, an exclusion criteria. Failure to provide information required or providing inaccurate misleading information when participating in procurement exercise and uh, failure to fulfill obligations related to payment of social security contributions and or taxes. As I mentioned before, beyond the eligibility and exclusion criteria outlined above, uh, <coughs> details will be set uh, to, the select, to the set of selection award criteria will be also foreseen and will be in detail uh, uh, described in our call for tenders, in our terms of reference, taking, of course, into consideration the, uh, <coughs> the three PCP phases. Moving to the uh, indicative selection criteria, uh, economic operators must have uh, the capacity tools and material equipment to carry out, of course, research and lab prototyping, produce and supply a limited set of first products or services, and uh, be able to demonstrate that these products or services are suitable for production or, or supply in quantity and to, quali quali uh, to quality standards defined by uh, Kemea and the other uh, uh, procurers. The financial organization structures to manage, exploit and transfer or sell the results of the PCP and generate revenue, revenue by marketing commercial applications of the results. And uh, of course, uh, uh, economic operators must have an economic and financial capacity to complete the project. Uh, when uh, uh, potential bidders will be uh, invited to uh, submit a, their tender, they will, uh, uh, at first, uh, at first uh, phase, they will only have to submit the European Secret Procurement document, which is 
as you may know, uh, an, a self-declaration of, uh, of the financial status, abilities and stability for, the, for a public procurement procedure, which uh, more or less contains all the information needed and requested, uh, as we mentioned uh, above. What is uh, really uh, interesting and uh, uh, different from a usual public procurement uh, for PCPs is the, how a PCP deals with uh, IPRs, intellectual property rights. Uh, as the Sattler Consortium has already decided, Sattler proposes an IPR approach which is fully aligned, of course, with the fundamental principles of the PCP. The partners will therefore set up the suitable mechanism that will allow sharing risk and benefit between the contracting authority and the PCP uh, contractors. Those mechanisms will be based <coughs> on the following uh, principles. Uh, on, on one hand, the ownership rights of IPRs generated by a supplier during the contract will be assigned and remain to that supplier and all consortium members and <coughs> the institutions, of course, of the European Union, since uh, SACL is a co-financed uh, financed project, will be assigned a worldwide free and non-exclusive license to use the R&D results for internal use. This license will be irrevocable. Moreover, in uh, the call for tenders and also in the framework agreement that will be signed uh, between the lead procurer, the procurers and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the contractors, a callback provision will ensure, will, a callback provision will be uh, set and will, be, will ensure that ownership rights of the IPRs are not exploited, which are not exploited uh, within four years after the finalization of the contract will have to be returned to the consortium members. Any of the consortium members can, uh, any of the consortium member can uh, request the contractors to offer licenses to third parties under, of course, fair and reasonable market conditions with uh, consideration of the rights of other third parties that do not accrue to the contractors. The price of, uh, the, price of the R&D services provided will be considered as a market price which includes a financial compensation according to the market conditions compared to exclusive development price. The language uh, that will uh, govern the, the whole pro procedure will be of course English. Requests to participate and tenders must be written in English only. Derivables uh, must be written in English of course and communication, any communication relating to either the tender procedure or the implementation of the contract must be carried out in English only. Moving on to uh, a few slides on the uh, legal framework. I don't want to, uh, to say a lot of things. What I would like to highlight more is uh, mostly is that uh, um, on the basis of uh, procurement directive uh, uh, 24 of 2014 and uh, of the directive uh, 81 of 2009, the tender, this tender, the subject PCP, falls out the scope of the application of di directives. Uh, but uh, Sattler, the Sattler Consortium, uh, Consortium uh, chose to adopt the following basic principles. Compliance, of course, with all general principles of EU public procurement, uh, law, mainly the principle of transparency, equal treatment, non-discrimination, proportionality, protection of free and uh, undistorted competition without strictly following the procedural obligations set for, forth uh, by procurement directive. We try to, uh, to have the, as much as publicity as possible, uh, so we aim at the maximization of the publicity of the contract by advertising in, in the uh, official journal of uh, the European Union with a contrary remark that the tender is not falling the, uh, under the scope of, uh, of uh, procurement directive. Ex exception of the tender from the scope also of the application of the Greek uh, relevant legislation on uh, public procurement, which is the 
uh, law uh, 4412 of uh, 2016. Uh, as Maria mentioned before, our uh, procurement is also accepting from uh, WTO GPA and uh, we uh, decided as consortium to follow and to adopt the open procedure uh, uh, so as to, uh, to have an open, uh, an open process uh, open to all. Uh, and if a contractor uh, claims that is unaware of any of the terms and conditions of the tender documents, as well as the annexes uh, to the documents for forming part thereof, this does not relieve it uh, relieve them, him from the strict compliance uh, uh, with their obligations. The tender and then dispute of or claim uh, claim arising. Uh, uh, during or in connection with the uh, uh, with uh, the call for tenders uh, uh, is uh, uh, is under the public procurement law and the Greek legislation, uh, and the courts of Greece, uh, as the procurement will be governed by the Greek law, uh, the courts of Greece will have uh, uh, exclusive jurisdiction to settle any dispute or claim arising uh, during. Uh, uh, the uh, the whole procedure. Of course, uh, the provisions of the state aid framework is are also uh, uh, all, uh, is all, all, are also go governing our uh, procedure, and also our procedure is designed in accordance with the provisions of the EC, of the EC governing uh, and uh, <coughs> uh, providing all all the provisions for uh, the PCP. In particular, and has to be implemented according to uh, the price paid for the relevant services fully that it has to fully reflect the market value of the benefits received by the public purchase and the risk taken by the participating providers. The selection procedure is open, transparent, competitive and non-discriminatory and of course is based on objective selection and award criteria specified in advance in the bidding uh, procedure. <clears throat> the arrangements uh, of, the of the contracts will describe all rights and obligations of the parties, including, as we, we mentioned before, uh, IPR's provision and will be, of course, available uh, in uh, due time to all uh, potential bidders. The procurement does not give uh, any of the PCP contractors uh, um, any preferential treatment, the supply of commercial volumes of the final products or services to, uh, to one of the uh, public uh, procurers or any other procurer in the major state concerned. So, uh, leading to the uh, closing this uh, presentation, I would like to highlight, to shortly highlight the benefits for potential bidders uh, to participate in the subtle PCP, as of course uh, in any uh, pre-commercial procurement. First of all, uh, a PCP is, an, is opening up to mar uh, new markets, business opportunities for companies, public procurement market accounts around, uh, let's say, 3 trillion uh, euros per year. It's a very big market with a huge potential that offers business opportunities to companies that already that are already in the security field, but also for companies active in other sectors that we are willing to expand and to find new activities there. Moreover, PCPs facilitate uh, the participation of SMEs by enabling them to grow according to the gradual increase of the budget per phase. By the end of the subtle PCP, participant SMEs will be in a position to provide commercial volumes of the developed innovative solution, being set ready for a possible commercial rolling out of this solution to the market. On uh, the other hand, PCPs are helping also larger uh, market players bring uh, products to the market, and they could also collaborate with SMEs, taking advantage of their creativity. As of the uh, universities, they can participate as suppliers, enabling thus the commercialization of innovative solutions developed by their spin-offs. Moreover, it's uh, important to note that demand-driven innovation through 
procurement offers the opportunity for uh, innovation solutions to the commercialized uh, faster than in cases where such a demand does not uh, exist. What is more, as you can understand, through APCP, companies are getting contracts and not grants, and suppliers are paid for the R&D services at market price, which is not the case for, the case for grants, where usually private, uh, private entities are not paid at market price and surely at a percentage of uh, less than, uh, than 100%. As you know, uh, <clears throat> Satri PCP is a cross-border joint procurement. That means that procurers from different EU members, EU member states, are joining forces, creating economies of scale. This gives opportunities to business to a cross-border growth to expand and to find markets in other countries. What I would like also to highlight is that an important element of the PCP is that uh, potential bidders, potential suppliers, companies um, are developing a solution for an existing public need. Private entities participating as uh, suppliers in this PCP will have the opportunity to develop gradually following the life cycle of innovation, an innovative solution to tackle a public need that will be uh, throughout described in our tender documents. Given that this public is served by other public entities across Europe, uh, this public need is served by other public Euro uh, entities across Europe, participation in uh, satellite PCP will open up business opportunities for these companies towards other public entities which are not participating in SACL consortium as potential customers. Concluding our presentation, it's worth it to note that uh, suppliers awarded a contract in the PCP uh, are using this contract, are, are, will, will have the chance to use this contract as reference to other potential customers, public or private, that are sharing this specific need not only at European, but also and, uh, at international level. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, in the meantime, we've had some uh, comments and questions in the, the chat. It seems like uh, interest is being raised and um, interest to, to build a part, uh, consortium to, uh, to be able to answer the, the call for tender. So um, there was a question uh, from Payan, which was actually also um, Lina's question, so maybe I will start with this uh, question. Which kind of technical specifications do you send to the tenders supposed to be selected? Requirements and KPI presented us today do not constitute a solid and strong specification to work with. Does it exist another document more technical so that uh, participants can uh, see whether they can answer the, the call? And she says, um, I am in line with Payan's question. Do you need to partner with an engineering office having some specific skills as mechanical, electronical, IT, industrial design, or whatever? Uh, so I guess the, the idea is to see how to, uh, to build the, the, um, uh, the necessary competencies uh, in order to, um, uh, to answer the call for tender. I don't know who wants to answer that question. Maybe Eleni? Can you hear me now? Yeah, uh, did okay. you? Okay. Uh, yes, I could um, partly answer. Uh, I would uh, say, first of all, that um, it's not us that we are looking for uh, a partner. Uh, every potential bidder, every company, or every every um, a, a person could um, network and uh, find a partner through our matchmaking tool in order to form a consortium or in order to to be uh, to join uh, to submit the joint tender or to uh, to be the subcontractor of another company uh, for specific uh, uh, let's say parts of our procurement so it's not us that we are looking for a partner uh, every uh, uh, legal entity or every natural person ha have to uh, uh, try to network and jointly find uh, a way to collaborate. Uh, as of the uh, requirement, the specifications, uh, as all our colleagues mentioned before, we are in uh, in the in a process uh, 
uh, that we are forming these specifications. And this is uh, the reason why we, are, we have this open market consultation in order to uh, check with the market whether uh, our need, what we are looking for, uh, is something that is visible, is something that does not exist in the market, and it's something that can can be done can be done through R and D. Yeah, Maria sent uh, um, a URL for matchmaking tool. So uh, if you look at the chat, you will see that the, there is the tool that you can use for matchmaking. Uh, Maria, if you want to jump jump in to uh, present that tool, please feel free to to do that. Uh, I would need also to um, talk about the uh, the comment from uh, Daniela about image database. Um, so she uh, sent some information to be uh, uh, about the plugins and image processing softwares. Uh, so uh, for the, the the participants, maybe it's interesting to to also. Um, Take that information. Thank you very much, Daniela, for sharing that with us. And uh, Maria, if you want to uh, to speak about the um, the matchmaking form. Uh, no, just uh, I have uh, sent it. It's a form that uh, every company uh, or uh, everyone who wants to uh, find partner partners in order to formulate a consortium can uh, use. Uh, or uh, uh, also, uh, I would like to mention that uh, in the website there is a list of companies uh, available for that are already searching for uh, partnerships. Uh, so everyone who is uh, interested uh, in uh, fi in uh, finding more uh, partners uh, can uh, use this uh, form and the list of companies uh, in the subtle uh, website. Um, there was a question from Andrew. Can companies from outside the EU, EEA or H2020 associated countries be part of a tender as, for example, a supplier? I think I could uh, uh, reply to this question. Mm -hmm. uh, as we presented in, um, in our uh, PowerPoint, um, entitled to participate uh, uh, either as um, uh, one company or a single entity or a, a, or by submitting a joint tender or subcontracting uh, are um, companies that are uh, established under the law of the of the countries having their or, of the following countries and having their central administration or principal place of business or registered office in one of the following countries as you mentioned eu and the uh, member states Horizon 2020 associated countries having signed a bilateral agreement with the EU on security procedures for exchanging and protecting classified information. So, uh, if I understand correctly your question, uh, companies outside uh, the EU uh, or Horizon 2020 associated countries cannot be uh, part of, uh, of uh, a tender. But I will, uh, if you want to uh, raise some uh, additional questions, please do so. I wanted just to uh, broadcast the um, the matchmaking form, uh, just to so show you. I hope you can see my screen right now. So this is on the uh, Shuttle PCP EU um, uh, website, and you see the matchmaking form. So um, please do not hesitate to uh, to get back to that. Uh, after the, the webinar, if you want to, um, you see you have also the list of companies uh, to partner with. So uh, this link can be sent to you also after the, the webinar. Yeah, I think if, if I understand Andrew's question correctly, he wants to be involved in Shuttle, but he fears that since he's in England, the Brexit, uh, which will probably come, uh, will prevent him from joining. If I understand correctly, um, he, the, the English companies after Brexit, if Brexit will go on and if um, uh, England will not be part of the European Union, he sh will not be able to um, enter the bids as a supplier, but that will not prevent him, if I understand correctly, to act as a subcontractor. So if a European company will uh, take the bid, uh, be contracted, 
we as a shuttle com uh, consortium will not prevent that company from uh, dealing with Andrew in England, if I, I'm right there. Just to know, just to say, and to to know that uh, since we are a, a Horizon 2020 uh, co-funded project, we have to follow. We have to follow and respect the rules as set by uh, Horizon 2020. And this stage today, we don't have any guidance on that uh, by Horizon 2020. Uh, uh, let's say managing authorities, the European Commission, for example. So. Uh, we cannot really uh, have an answer today because today uh, there is no um, uh, there is no uh, uh, result or any conclusion on on how Horizon 2020 project uh, will have to deal with uh, UK companies. So uh, to be honest, uh, the answer uh, cannot be uh, really finalized at this time. Final at this time. Uh, a follow-up can be made uh, with uh, Andrew on this, I'm sure, uh, with the consortium. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So, uh, if anybody else wants to raise a question, that is the time to um, to do that. Or if also, also one of the speakers wants to um, add any addition to what was presented, Please uh, reactivate your, your camera and mic. In any case, I think it was very clear. Thank you very much for everybody for staying uh, to the webinar. Uh, I think uh, a lot of information was uh, broadcasted. Let's start. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your attention and for attending to the webinar. Thank you for your attention, everybody.